Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm Alistair Freeman, partner in our corporate finance team, uh, and I sit in our restructuring and insolvency uh, team as well. Uh, I'm joined by a few of my colleagues from across Burness Paul, and they're each going to talk about some of the current issues in their specialist areas. Um, they, you may know most, if not all of them, uh, Sean Saluja in employment, uh, Rona Jameson health and safety, uh, Brian Hemming in our E&P team, Helen Dixon in corporate finance, and Julie Gregg in dispute resolution. Uh, a few housekeeping notes, which I should have noted myself. One, make sure that your, your mute buttons are being selected to limit any background noise. Um, we've automatically muted you when you've joined the call, but if you could just um, make sure that you keep yourself muted, that'd be great. Um, also, please feel free to ask any questions via the WebEx chat function. Um, if you can direct your questions to me as chair, uh, I'll try and uh, put these up as we go along. Uh, we're not going to open the floor, just given the numbers uh, for discussions at the end, uh, so please use the chat function. Um, We'll try and deal with many of these as the, the time allows, but if, if there's any we don't, then we can always follow up in due course. Um, all the questions will be anonymized so we can record the webinar and then just distribute it afterwards. Um, WebEx have said they're, as you would expect, having some capacity issues. Uh, so with everyone using uh, remote working, um, we're obviously all, looks like we're all okay at the moment, but if there are any issues, we'll call a halt to the the webinar and follow up with details for when we can reconvene uh, another time and date. And just to let you know, the session will be recorded and will be available to everyone afterwards and also up on our website. Um, some were not able to join today, so we're intending to send the recordings to them. And if you have any queries about that, then please check out our privacy policy on the Burnus Poll website. So uh, that's that all done. If we sort of turn maybe first of all to uh, Sean and Rona uh, on the basis, I guess, the most sort of pressing impact that we've seen recently is probably in, in relation to personnel. Uh, and maybe Sean, we sort of start things by maybe giving us a sort of update just in relation to how we're seeing the, the government's furlough scheme, which has clearly been attracting a lot of press attention recently. Um, are there any particular aspects relevant to the oil and gas sector? Uh, and I'm thinking there, first of all, uh, uh, obviously there's, there's the, the combination of, of COVID and also oil price uh, uh, difficulties at the moment. So is, is the scheme accessible um, where there's maybe some debate around the, the reasoning for, for accessing it? Uh, and then in particular, uh, would businesses may be looking forward that they, they, they may see little prospect of work when the scheme actually ends uh, and indeed beyond the rest of this year, is that still um, allowing businesses to access the scheme. Thanks, Alistair. And um, you're right that the employment and industrial relations area has faced huge challenges from the beginning of the pandemic due to multiple factors. Um, and as you say, that's a combination of the virus on the one hand, but also significant effect on commodity prices and a reduction in activity. We're facing new legislation and novel concepts. And Prior to the Chancellor's announcement on 20th March, furlough was a term I'd only heard occasionally from US-based clients, but I think it's the word I've used the most every day since then. And you'd only expect detailed regulation legislation for such novel concepts, but the urgency simply hasn't allowed for that. We now have significant employment legislation being introduced by government guidance and opinions from HMRC um, delivered via Twitter and announcements over weekends and evenings. And I've got a great deal of sympathy for in-house lawyers and HR professionals trying to keep up to date with what is a rapidly moving target. The, the, the coronavirus job retention scheme opened to applications officially yesterday, Monday, and there were apparently 140,000 applications for grants made on that day, first payments to be processed in six working days. And it's clear what the broad intention of the scheme is, um, which is to provide employers who are economically impacted by uh, COVID-19 with temporary relief, relief from a wage bill for those workers who actually agree to be furloughed for a temporary period of time up to a cap. But there are aspects of this scheme which give rise to bigger issues and as you've highlighted really um, a couple which I want to focus on here which are I think unique to the oil and gas sector. The first question is what link an employer needs to show between um, to coronavirus in the current situation or its access to the grant. And 
we're seeing that many businesses are, are impacted by by both both factors. It seems to me that there are kind of three broad scenarios looking at this. The first is where an employer's potential downmanning or other reduction staff had no link at all to coronavirus. And so, for example, some employers were already looking at restructurings and had started consultation processes prior to the scheme being announced. Now, clearly, there must be some link to coronavirus by the very nature of the, of the, of the scheme name itself. And I think in that type of situation, an employer runs a higher risk of not being able to access the grant. On the other hand, there may be a very obvious link between uh, an impact on operations uh, and the need to reduce a wage bill. And in those circumstances, access to the scheme is much clearer. But in many cases, there are mixed factors and an expected long-term impact due to the commodity price. Now, given the government's stated intent of the width of the scheme, where those factors are mixed, although there is some risk, it would appear that employers ought to be able to access the scheme if that's the cause of what's happened. Our advice is that you document and review your reasoning because HMRC have advised employers to keep records for five years and they are going to potentially audit uh, matters sometime down the line. A second and perhaps bigger issue is the one that you've also mentioned, that, Alistair, which is accessibility to the scheme where an employer has concluded now that the prospect of future work in the short and medium term, predominantly due to the position on the commodity markets, is low. And many businesses that we're speaking to in the service sector are forecasting reduced activity for the rest of 2020 and, in some cases, into 2021. Now, the question is, does the scheme apply or is it, is it accessible in those circumstances? And the been a lot of headlines recently in the media and Energy Voice in particular from trade unions who obviously signed up to the scheme that in every single situation an employer should make application for grants under the scheme. The question then is what is the true intent of the scheme and I think it's a potential outcome here that HMRC may conclude if an audit were to take place that in essence that type of scenario essentially results in a form of enhanced redundancy payment and perhaps was not the intent of the scheme when it was introduced. Now, the difficulty on this aspect is there is no clear guidance. It's a sector issue, and it's a risk balance for employers to weigh up. And further guidance, which I know that OG UK are pushing for, would be very welcomed. If an application were to be made and then reclaimed in a subsequent audit, that could have a major financial cost to employers. On the other hand, trade unions, I know, are threatening potential mass unfair dismissal claims if employers don't make application for the grant. Our advice, again, is that employers should carefully weigh up their decision making and record that. And ultimately, when you look at it from an employment tribunal perspective, requ employers require to show that they've acted reasonably and in good faith, which is a test that has obviously some broad aspects of discretion to it. So it's, it's a difficult scenario for employers to wade through. Another aspect to the scheme on an operational perspective is the extent to which can be accessible to those who are in extremely vulnerable and vulnerable categories. And the government's clarified that those who are shielding extremely vulnerable can make access to the furlough scheme and are now eligible to SSP. However, that's not the case for those in the vulnerable category and that in itself gives rise to a number of health and safety concerns, which I know that Ron is going to touch on. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, uh, just to be clear, what we're talking about here in relation to the um, vulnerable persons group uh, is not that group who are in the extreme category where they require to be shielded, but it's a group that the um, government clinical advisors have identified as being at increased risk of um, severe illness from uh, COVID-19 and includes quite a, a large group of people. So uh, a number of respiratory diseases such as asthma, bronchitis, um, heart disease, kidney disease, um, diabetes, um, being overweight, um, you know, a number of um, uh, types of illness that wouldn't normally prevent someone from working, but seems to uh, greatly increase the risk here of, of complications. 
and the furlough scheme, as Shauna said, is, is not available for employees in uh, that category. So um, we've had a number of queries already from clients asking, what do we do about people who are in that category? They're clearly at some form of increased risk. Um, what can we do, particularly in the offshore environment, where a lot of the social distancing measures are, are providing uh, quite a challenge? Uh, Oil and Gas UK has been looking at this for some weeks and uh, just at the end of last week they issued some guidance to the industry um, which is helpful uh, and it sort of sets out the process that you need to go through. There are no um, silver bullet answers here but uh, it, it kind of confirms uh, effectively what the law would require an employer to do. So, so the first thing is for each employer to take occupational advice to determine who is in that vulnerable category and obviously you need information from your employees about that whether that's a questionnaire or um, or whether you you ask them to come forward and, and speak to you about it um, and uh, they're, they're quite clear that it's for each employer to do this you can't rely on the operator to um, identify who is vulnerable and take the decisions they're, they're putting the responsibility on each operate on each employer and I think that's what the law would require as well under your Health and Safety at Work Act duties. And the principal thing you need to do is then carry out a risk assessment, which may be specific to each individual, because each individual's risk will be different, their risk profile will be different. So you need to look at what are the particular risks associated with the condition that the employee has, and then what are the particular um, precautions and measures that are in place on the installation in order to try and, and limit and control uh, the risk. And it's for the operators to provide that information to the employers so that they can carry out their risk assessment. And that will include information about um, medical evacuation and particular times and how quickly someone can be evacuated if they become ill the changes to working practices that have been implemented in order to try and, uh, so far as possible, introduce uh, social distancing. Uh, and similarly with cabin uh, allocation and cabin occupation, is there single cabin occupancy or not? Um, and are there any other measures that are in place on the installation? Um, and there's a range here depending on the approach the operator has taken uh, and, and the ability to do certain things. So some we know recently have introduced testing before mobilization, um, others are supplying PPE, um, and there are others who are, who are carrying out regular temperature checks. So all of that needs to be factored into the risk assessment. And I think probably there needs to be a separate written risk assessment for everyone who is in that vulnerable category because their particular needs may differ. You may be able to divide it up by class, depending on the, the particular risk, but from a point of view of demonstrating that you've actually carried out that assessment for each person, um, I think it would be uh, advisable to have it as an individual written assessment for each person identified in that category. Um, the other thing you need to do, uh, I think, is consult with the vulnerable employee on the risk assessment. There are obviously general obligations to consult your employees on risk assessment of um, safety measures that affect them. And so I think that should be done um, just to be sure that you fully understand the conditions and that they understand the precautions that are being taken. Um, and ultimately they need to be happy that, that they accept the risk. Um, but the duty here is on the employer to make the decision about deployment and they must do that once they've completed the risk assessment, provided they are happy that any risks have been reduced to a level that is as low as reasonably practicable and also acceptable. Um, the health and safety executive have issued a couple of statements as well about how they are approaching the issue, um, not specifically in relation to offshore, but generally. And that's simply to say that they expect social distancing measures to be implemented um, so far as reasonably practicable in any workplace where work is continuing. Um, they've also uh, issued a statement to say that in any case where evidence suggests that an employee subsequently diagnosed with a uh, COVID-19 illness, 
is likely to have contracted that uh, infection in the workplace requires a RIDA report to be made. So they are going to be gathering data on, um, on individuals who appear to have been infected in the workplace. Um, and it's not yet clear what view is going to be taken of that. We can see in some other countries that where um, there is a real concern about the way in which um, precautions were implemented or a lack of precautions uh, have, have led to uh, a number of deaths that they are looking very seriously at enforcement. I think there was something on the news just last night about uh, a number of prosecutions uh, uh, in contemplation in Spain, for example, in relation to the care home uh, deaths that have occurred there. Um, and I suppose the final thing to bear in mind in all of this, and, and something that the Health and Safety Executive have again issued a separate statement on, is that whilst all this is going on, and we're facing a huge number of challenges about the risks of, of COVID-19, you mustn't forget that there are a number of um, other important occupational risks that are still there in the workplace, particularly uh, offshore. And so um, health and safety executive have made it clear that they are still going to be um, carrying out their regulatory and enforcement functions in relation to normal occupational hazards, um, with a particular focus on the uh, high hazard industries like the offshore industry. And that where they uh, feel that um, there are not appropriate measures being taken, then then they will enforce. Um, and I think it's a, it is a real it is a real risk when we have something so distracting going on on, on such a mass level that there there will be increased risk of things going wrong in terms of normal operations. Um, there's lots of evidence that when uh, workers are distracted, that human factors risks increase substantially, uh, and they will be distracted by worries about themselves and colleagues, and, and worries about what's happening at home with, with people, particularly if they have um, relatives in a, in a sort of vulnerable or extremely vulnerable um, situation. Um, uh, and, and also when you have changes to working practices, that increases risk. So. Uh, I think health and safety executive will be looking to be reassured that whilst the industry is managing this enormous problem, they're not taking their eye off the ball in relation to the other important risks that, that need to be dealt with. Um, and uh, health and safety executive have indicated that where necessary, they will still travel offshore in order to carry out inspections and, and investigations. Uh, how how feasible that's going to be, we'll need to wait and see, but that's that's certainly their intention. So um, a number of significant challenges to the industry, but in effect, all the advice is really just confirming what we probably all know about the, the, the duties here, which is you need to risk assess, you need to understand the risk, you need to identify the measures, and you need to implement them to get the risks down as, as low as reasonably practical. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Rona. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, some some, uh, some fairly, fairly thought provoking there. Uh, and uh, if you've got any queries or whatever, by all means, uh, you can use the web chat function to raise questions. If you just want to send them to me um, down there as Alistair in the participants list. Um, thank you for that. Um, so that's in terms of, I guess, sort of dealing with the sort of personnel and the workforce. Um, I guess the other sort of operational impact that we might typically be seeing are going to be the sort of follow up in terms of issues of uh, operation of the contractual and the agreement matrix that, that we're operating under. Um, and I guess the particular issues are going to be, you know, where we're uh, not able to, to, to perform contracts in the way that they were originally intended. Uh, and I think we're going to ask Brian, Helen, and Julie just to. Um, Take us through some of the sort of issues that are going to be arising through those. So, if I can hand over to you, Brian, and you can maybe just start off just in terms of chatting through some of the kind of key points on active contract management. Yeah, th thanks, Alistair, and uh, morning, everyone. 
yeah, as Alistair says, it's very much the initial focus is on the uh, the, the immediate operational issues, the the, uh, the, the employees, the cost control and, and project spend, etc. Then what we typically see happening is the the contractual issues coming to the fore, the, the force majeure claims, uh, default possible insolvency issues, which which we're going to cover and, and and talk about each of them. But I think the main thing I would like to stress is is there's, a, there's an earlier step. Once you get into those uh, those FM type claims. The agreements tend to be quite regulated and, and prescriptive as to the steps that need to be taken and the timings for it. And, and what you don't want to find is, is you're immediately lumped into that because there's a lot of those agreements are, uh, if, if you've got force majeure occurring under, under one of them, it will probably impact a number of other agreements as well. So, uh, so it escalates very quickly. So, so good uh, and proactive contract and agreement management. It, it's, it's fairly obvious, but it's, it's times like these that it really needs to be, be uh, at the forefront of your mind. Uh, you know, these aren't things that should be left on the shelf and, uh, and dusted off when, when times get difficult. You need to understand exactly what's in your contracts and the agreements, what are your rights and obligations, what are the other parties' rights and obligations, and, and what are the likely problem areas that is going to come up. Uh, just, just, just so you know what's, what's required. Uh, also ensure you're in compliance with your contracts. When it's, when it's difficult times like this, you might find the other parties trying to get out of it. So you don't want to give them the nice uh, opportunity to do that through, through being in, in some form of breach of, of a fairly minor obligation. So, so definitely make sure you're in compliance with them. If it's contracts you've got for goods and services, make sure do you have alternative backup uh, contracts if, uh, if your key supplier is, is unable to perform. Uh, if, if it's goods and services that are coming from abroad as well, have you got a UK supplier that, uh, that might be, be uh, easier to, uh, to, to get the goods from in, in this difficult times? And if it's, if it's an AMP company and you've got production shut down, what does that mean for your transportation agreements and all the related documentation? You know, just make sure you understand what the, the consequences are. So, so it's really important just to, just to have that proper understanding of, of, of exactly what you've got under your, your contracts and agreements. We always talk about collaboration in the industry. It's, it's a well-used term, but, but now more than ever, it's far better if you're having discussions with, with the other parties to your agreements, have them up front before you get into that difficult situation, because particularly if you start going down the route of, of, of well, default in particular, uh, you can find it drives you to a conclusion that there might have been a better way around it if you'd just spoken to each other earlier. So, so collaboration, speaking to, to the other parties is, is definitely key. And the other observation I'd make is, is responsibility for, for agreement and contract management often doesn't rest with the legal team. They usually sit in a procurement group or an asset or commercial team. It's still important that legal legal reps should be, be checking with, with those teams, make sure they are thinking about these things. I know from some of the conversations I've had with, uh, with clients that some of those discussions are happening and, and people are, are querying what happens in the, in the, the agreements around, around FM, et cetera. But, but make sure they are considering these issues now. Because like I say, please, please don't leave it to the last minute because uh, you will get swamped when uh, when it all starts flying and, and kicking off. So, so, so that's step one. I would really, really urge everyone to, to make sure they are considering the uh, the active contract management and, and looking and understanding your contracts. But understanding is one thing. Obviously, once you uh, either yourself or the other party is uh, prevented from performing its obligations. That uh, then triggers the whole issue as well. How can you get out of that? Are you relief from, the, from that obligation through to being able to claim force majeure? And, and what constitutes force majeure very much depends. I mean, it sounds terrible legal stuff, but it depends on the contract. It depends on the agreement. You need to, to need to look at each one individually. But maybe Helen, if I can can hand over you, why, why don't you talk us through what the, the key sort of FM issues are that you're seeing from the particularly from the service side of it? The industry, and, uh, and then I can come back and, and talk about it from the EMP perspective. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Frank. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, hopefully, you can. And uh, apologies for not being visual today. Um, I've got a small child who's running in and out of this room all the time, so um, probably don't want to see her. I'll be like that that guy that was on on um, the newsreader who had a small child um, come in and disrupt his new news broadcast. I've also got a husband who's just walked in. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to look at um, force majeure clauses in terms of um, mainly logic, um, because supply chain contracts largely are based on logic, and we 
I'll, I'll, I'll look at it from from that assumption. Um, I'm going to talk you through because I think it's quite important just to reread what the the main limb of the force majeure clause in logic says. I think it's probably fair to say um, that not a huge amount of of um, negotiation goes into the force majeure clause, maybe with the exception of um, at the at the end of a force majeure sort of standstill period, if you like, there being an ability on the parties to terminate the contract. Um, but I, I don't. My, my impression is that not a huge amount of negotiation takes place on the force majeure actual terms. Um, so looking looking at what logic says on the, the first limb, if you like, of, on the main operative clause on force measure, what it says is that neither party shall be responsible for any failure to, to fulfil any term or condition of the contract if and to the extent that fulfilment has been delayed or temporarily prevented by a force majeure, majeure occurrence, as hereinafter defined, which has been notified in accordance with Clause 12.3, and which is beyond the control and without the fault or negligence of the party affected, and which, by the exercise of reasonable diligence, the said party is unable to provide against. So that that's the key provision in logic and probably a lot of the supply chain contracts that are derived from logic as to what force majeure, um, what, what the, the, the operative provision of the force majeure clause um, says. So I'm going to look at key things to look out for in relation to potential force majeure, majeure claims and situations. I think it's bit worth bearing in mind, again, you know, most of these contracts governed by English law. English law itself has no def definition itself of what force majeure means, um, which is why a lot of the contracts will try to provide for um, a definition and the, the second limb of, of the force majeure clause in logic and in many of the contracts for the supply chain industry um, has detailed um, what they consider to be force majeure, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so there's kind of 10 main points that I'm going to cover. I'm going to try and do it quite quickly because we're already kind of running out a little bit of time. So the first is check that there is a force majeure clause at all. Um, there will be, I'm sure, some contracts where there isn't one, mainly, I suppose, if, if you're working on, you know, short, shortish form T's and C's. Um, so in the event that there is no force majeure clause at all, you're probably looking at um, whether there's, there are grounds ultimately to, to terminate the contract through the operation of um, the doctrine of frustration of the contract. Equally, there may be provisions in any relevant local laws, um, such as the law of, of the place of performance of the contract that might be helpful in the event that there is no um, force measure clause in the contract. Secondly, who, be clear and check who can claim force majeure. So can, can either party claim force majeure um, or, or is it only one party? I think in terms of logic, I think that, that both, both parties could probably claim force majeure. However, of course, force majeure is, is a relief, if you like, r rather than, you know, so, so ultimately you claim force majeure relief from someone who's claiming that you have breached a contract. Um, and so you're saying, no, but it was force majeure, so I'm not responsible. Um, so check who can claim. Um, thirdly, foreseeability. So some contracts will exclude events from force majeure that could have reasonably have been provided against or overcome. Um, the logic contract, uh, as I read out, says that it has to be an event beyond the control without the fault or negligence of the party affected and which by the e exercise of reasonable diligence that party was unable to provide against. So you, you have to have foreseeability. Um, so if it's something that you could have foreseen happening, you probably won't be able to, to claim force majeure. Um, I think, think we're probably safe to say here that 
a global pandemic was not foreseeable because nobody seems to particularly have foreseen it. Um, but you know, query on that. Not 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 entirely sure what what reasonable would be in that situation. I suspect it wouldn't be this. Um, the fourth point is causation. Um, so the first major event must be the cause of the failure to perform. It sounds kind of obvious. Um, that is mostly determined by the facts, and I think should be reasonably easy to ascertain. Um, interestingly, the the contract in the logic terms talks about not impossible to perform, um, but what it says, fulfil it says fulfilment has been delayed or temporarily prevented. So that's probably indicative of the fact that logic contracts are, are intended to be a balanced position as between both you know both sides essentially um so it's not it's not impossible to perform so that's probably something that you should look out for when you're looking at these contracts with a view to ascertaining what where where you stand and what your rights are um the fifth point um duty to mitigate um so the party claiming the force majeure relief is usually under duty to show that it's taken reasonable steps to mitigate and avoid the force majeure claim. And in fact, clause 12.3 of the force majeure um, provision and logic talks about it, it's talking about notice being given, um, but it, it says the parties will give full particulars of the circumstances and quote, shall use all, reason, all reasonable endeavours to remedy the situation without delay. So it's important to remember that if, if you are the party that potentially can't perform your contract, your, your contract may well have those type of obligations to use all reasonable endeavours to remedy the situation without delay. And when, when a contract uses all use reasonable endeavours, what that all as opposed to simply use reasonable endeavours when you see all reasonable endeavours the case law tells you that that means you require to expend money in order to um to discharge those reasonable endeavours so keep that in mind so duty to mitigate um the next point is notice already touched on it um as i said 12.3 deals with notice Brian has already mentioned it's important to make sure that when when you're getting to um, you know a, a potentially more fractious situation that you deliver any notice absolutely in accordance with the letter of the contract following exactly what the contract says. Um, the next point is local law. So even if the law is sorry, even if the contract is silent on force majeure. Um, there, there may well be local law implications in the place of the performance of the contract um, that could could impact on the the relationship and the ultimate outcome. Thinking along the lines of you know some of the civil law countries, Netherlands, France, there will be um, and, and there are provisions in the local law of those countries that that will determine. Um, some of the legal remedies when when there is a force majeure type of situation. Interestingly, and, and Norway is the other one that, that, and I don't actually know off the top of my head because I'm not a Norwegian lawyer. But um, it, you know, a lot of the, the the law in Norway is codified, and therefore it, it's it, it would be important if there are Norwegian contracts to make sure that you're getting Norwegian advice as to what what if anything the local law might impose in relation to um, your contractual rights. What, what interestingly we have heard about is um, that some countries, in particular um, China, has been issuing what they're calling force majeure certificates. Um, so it's a government certificate saying, I don't know who it's addressed to, but I guess it's addressed to counterparty, Saying that the company cannot perform its obligations because of force majeure, we, Julie and I spoke about this earlier this morning. Um, we don't know how the courts would interpret those type of certificates. 
particularly in in a situation where your force majeure clause may not cover the the specific scenario. Um, but you know, it's 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 it would be difficult to imagine a court completely ignoring something like that. But I don't think it's been tested yet. I think they're also issue the French government may well be issuing similar force majeure certificates. So again, something to bear in mind. Um, the eighth point is the the, the impact of the force majeure clause. So the, the the key thing to remember about the certainly the logic term um, is that the the issue of this force majeure notice, what it what it does is it following notification, the party it obligate obliges the parties to meet without delay. Um, with a view to agreeing a mutually acceptable course of action to minimise the effects of the force majeure event. So it doesn't bring the contract to an end. Um, it simply imposes the obligation to get together and try and figure a way through it. Um, that will, and, and I think that is the, the, the main thing that I've seen of difference between these the, the, the different types of service contracts, supply chain contracts rather, um, is that often you will see a period in which the parties will negotiate and discuss how they can get through the process of figuring out an alternative. And if they fail to do that by the end of, I don't know, like 90 days, I think is a common one, then the, ter the contract will terminate. What I would say there is it's important to remember that if you are having um, informal discussions, about how to deal with these you know difficult situations um you should probably just make it clear that they're without prejudice to any rights um so that you're not giving anything away um the next point i was going to cover is the, the actual circumstances that set out that the logic sets out constitute a force measure so there is a list that are one two seven limbs to it um, the main one being or the main point being that it doesn't include a pandemic um, so pandemics not included there are things like earthquake flood fire explosion various nuclear type events um, some things that I don't understand what they mean like sonic or supersonic speeds but I don't really know what that means but anyway um, maritime and aviation disasters. The final one is probably the limb that is is the most relevant here, and that is that a force majeure, a force majeure event is an occurrence which is a change to the general or local statute, ordinance, decree, or other law, including uh, bylaws of local or other authorities or the introduction of any such statute, ordinance, decree or law. Now clearly the situation that we're in now, um, which is, you know, the government has enforced a lockdown, um, you know, that that is a change to the law, albeit that, you know, that the oil and gas industry has been, you know, given the guidance through Oil and Gas UK that um it is able to keep going because it's a key, you know, key service or key workers. So again, I don't think that has been tested, but there's no obvious um, limb to create a force majeure definition other than that last one. Um, so not not easy. Um, and then finally, um, the the final point is is you know all else failing. You know there is there is the doctrine of frustration of contract. Um, Julie's going to touch on this in a second, but <coughs> excuse me. The final thing that I was going to say was really sort of you know, think. I think try and be careful in deciding um, whether it's the right thing to do to make a claim for non-performance. The whole of the supply chain is affected by similar issues here, um, and in fact. The decision to either, you know, withhold payment or to to pursue a claim on the back of an existing delay or breach could actually cause greater risks and increased um, 
supply failure, if you like, such as the insolvency of the supplier. Um, and I guess you have to weigh up the and balance the, the long term implications of, of something like that for your business, because it, it, in the long run, I mean, I suppose this, this will be over at some point and, you know, the industry will recover. Um, you know, Sean's talking mid next year. Um, who knows really at this stage, but it, it will recover at some point. And the long term implications of a much, much reduced in particular supply chain, you know, do, do, do companies want to have less choice? Because ultimately, when things do recover, that will mean less choice and less choice in relation to pricing. Um, so I suppose the, the ultimate point there is try and be open and upfront um, in the way you deal with things. If you think you're going to be in delay or in breach, um, raise that with your customers um, as soon as possible, albeit on a without prejudice basis. Try and be collaborative and proactive solutions um, are, are going to be, I think, more beneficial in the long run. Um, but, but I suppose it's, it's remember the bigger picture um, and try and find ways through this because everyone is going through this difficult time. And just because one supplier is not able to make a contract work doesn't necessarily mean any others will. Um, so I, I wanted to pass back to Brian because oh. I've been mainly talking about supply chain contracts using logic as their starting point, really. Um, what, what, Brian, do the E&P contracts look like in relation to Force Majeure? Is it similar, maybe slightly less restrictive? They are the, the, the broadly similar, and all, all the key issues, those 10 points you're raising, do apply equally. I think my, the main difference between uh, the E&P agreements compared to maybe the logic contracts is is you see some contracts are quite specific. Force majeure has to be one of these, these specified events. Uh, the EMP agreements, like transportation agreements, etc., tend to just any event beyond the reasonable control of a party acting as a reasonable, prudent operator. So lots of, lots of reasonable tests to uh, to satisfy. But uh, that's that's the main distinction of them. Of the ten points you mentioned, again, I've already mentioned the uh, the notice requirements for for notifying the claim. I've seen some of the agreements. Uh, when I've looked at the FM clauses, talk about you must notify within five business days of becoming aware of the event. So it can be quite tight. Uh, yeah. so, so you do need to be aware of that. And also, it's important that that's not this. You haven't finished it just by saying, "Well, I've in my from a force majeure notice. I'm I'm good now. I'm protected." You're not. There's an oblig ongoing obligation to make sure you you keep giving an update to the the other parties to what you're doing to to overcome the force majeure event. Uh, so so make sure you comply with those requirements. And equally, you mentioned termination for for lengthy force majeure. I mean, that particularly with COVID is uh, is is a worry. Some of the transportation type agreements will have uh, typically a 12 month force majeure, then uh, that gives right to termination, which should cause all sorts of chaos. So, uh, so but from the EMP perspective, I think that's the that's the main things to be to be aware of. Uh, just just uh, just keep on top of it. And Julie, is is it worthwhile you just saying a, a few words? Of, uh, we're we're a bit tight on time now. Um, so uh, Julie, I think was going to, you were just going to touch on um, frustration and also just give some sort of very broad update on, on what, what's happening with the Scottish courts and court processes. Sure. Thanks, Helen. Um, I'll try and keep this uh, brief because <laughs> uh, I'm conscious of the time. So uh, as Helen and Brian um, have spoken about, um, frustration may come into play where there is no force majeure clause or where the force majeure clause doesn't actually extend to, to deal with the coronavirus situation. So frustration can apply where after the contract has been entered into the, an unexpected event, so in, in this situation it would be the coronavirus, that's out with the control of the parties, renders performance of the contract illegal, impossible or radically different to what the parties had contemplated when they'd entered into the contract. Frustration is a difficult 
argument to make, and it's kind of often looked at as an argument of last resort. But I think given where we are with coronavirus and the challenges that we're seeing, I think we can expect some of these arguments to be made. And certainly I've already heard of them being made in the construction context. If the arguments around frustration are successful, then what happens is that effectively the contract is, is brought to an end and parties are discharged from future performance of the contract. So I think it's worth bearing in mind, particularly with some of the longer term contracts, as to whether you actually want to invoke that argument or not. I think in terms of the application of frustration as between the Scottish courts and the English courts, there's not a huge divergence and certainly the vast majority of the case law on the subject comes from the English courts. But where you may see a slight divergence is in relation to the consequences of frustration and that's because there's legislation, so it's the, the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act of 1943 applies in England, but that doesn't apply here in Scotland. So because that act deals with some of the consequences around what happens with payment obligations as a result of frustration, we could end up seeing some slight divergences as between the jurisdictions on that point. The question, of course, of whether COVID-19 is a frustrating event or not will, of course, vary on a contract by contract basis. And it will be really for the courts to interpret the contract in, in light of the, the factual matrix, the agreement itself and the, the prevailing circumstances. So I think we'll just have to, to wait with some interest to, to see what the courts do on that front. So just kind of touching um, briefly on the, the courts, certainly um, south of the border, I think they've kind of risen to the challenge pretty well. And the English courts um, are kind of functioning on a remote basis and hearings are still taking place. Judgments are still being handed down and, and they seem to be kind of operating on a business as usual basis. Here in Scotland, we've been slightly slower, um, I think, as a result of some technological issues. Um, the Court of Session in Edinburgh is now kind of getting to the stage where it's able to deal with some remote business. Certainly from an administrative point of view, um, I've not encountered any major difficulties, touch wood, as yet in terms of getting, whether that be papers lodged or, or decrease or, or whatever else. So I'm kind of treating it as business as usual at the moment and until you know I, I have a, a substantive hearing that, that might need a, a different approach. So I think that's positive. I think the one um, issue that we do have though is in relation to sheriff officers and because obviously of personal service in the rules around social distancing, they are not operating um, at their usual level. I think it is possible to get things served, but only on an absolutely urgent basis. So I think that is posing some challenges um, for us. I mean, I think we are generally seeing um, an increase in parties looking to enforce payment obligations. So certainly that's something that I've been advising quite a lot on over the last couple of weeks, but it's a tricky area. And Alistair, this is something that you can perhaps touch on because one of the, the challenges that I certainly have had in the advice that I've been giving is around the kind of government support hasn't yet trickled down to some businesses. So you've got businesses who today might actually be in a worse position than they would be in a month's time. And then there are questions around whether or not you can actually take steps and, and use insolvency procedures um, potentially to recover your debt. Alistair, do you want to, to kind of chip in on the insolvency front? Uh, yeah, no, th uh, thanks, Julie. Um, I suppose uh, 
I suppose just very briefly, because I think time's sort of marching on here, but uh, I suppose the, you know, uh, there's, there's COVID and there's oil price challenges, so, so there's very significant challenges through the supply chain. But, you know, the keys for all businesses being the same, really, liquidity and having cash to keep going. Um, and, and I guess the government has made some some steps to try and change some of the insolvency framework with a, a view to, not specifically for the oil and gas sector, but just across the, the, the board to try and... Uh, perhaps allow businesses to continue to to, uh, in, uh, to, to try and weather the storm. Um, and I'll, ju I'll just highlight a few of these. I mean, uh, probably the one that you sort of may, may have seen most sort of press on is the relaxation of uh, wrongful trading uh, rules, um, which I think sort of if you have a negative uh, view of that, it's sort of a bit like a rogues charter um, in the sense that there's an intention to give directors a bit more breathing space to continue um, to trade and therefore to incur liabilities to company suppliers and employees, I guess, even if they think that the company might be heading towards insolvency, but but, but there's a sort of, I guess, a, a recognition that it's perhaps better to allow business to continue uh, on the basis that that might enable them to access sort of government or, or, or bank funding. And I guess that's contrary to the normal rules where directors really, if they recognise that the, the business is, is reaching the point of no return, um, that, that if they continue to incur loss to, and increase uh, losses to creditors, then they, they, they run the real risk of being personally liable for that. And clearly, the government didn't want uh, a spate of, of a raft of uh, insolvencies by businesses shutting up. So I guess consistent with the things like the furlough scheme, um, there's been this relaxation. Um, that's, that's, I guess, the, the positive of that is that maybe businesses do manage to uh, continue uh, to keep the show on the road sufficiently to allow the, the kind of unwinding of maybe the COVID lockdown and therefore the kind of interim measures such as the, the, the furlough scheme might just allow them to continue to, to, to um, survive. Um, just very briefly, it's not really a rogues charter um, because the reality is that direct they haven't what they haven't waived are the normal directors' duties, which I guess would include having to act in the best interests of the company. In normal times, that would be for the interests of the shareholders. But if you're in that sort of insolvent uh, situation, really you have to act in the best interests of the company's creditors. So, so it may remove the the, the threat of personal uh, liability being incurred, but but ultimately properly done, directors should be sort of considering the, the interest of creditors and, and acting accordingly. Um, one other area which the government has now announced, and it actually isn't a COVID-related uh, issue, although they've obviously accelerated to trying to bring this into legislation, is the potential to have a new form of moratorium available to businesses that have not actually entered into administration. Um, Currently, if you enter into administration, which is the formal uh, insolvency process, that that business has the benefit of the moratorium, which is effectively a shield that comes forms around the business and no creditor can take any enforcement action. Um, they've identified that for distressed businesses, those that are not actually in that uh, formal insolvency, there's, there's, but they may still benefit from having that shield put around them to allow the management to, to, to continue to act and hopefully enough of a breathing space to consider their options for how, how to address problems. Um, therefore, you know, uh, bringing that in, I guess, may, uh, may help out more businesses uh, to, to kind of uh, deliver a successful rescue plan. Um, it's not available to those companies that are actually already unable to pay their debt. So, so, so while, while it, uh, it will hopefully provide a, a, an additional um, lever uh, or, or tool in the toolkit for um, businesses looking to actually take positive steps, but it, it certainly is not to to replace the the alternatives for businesses that really don't have uh, a sort of a, a plan to 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 survive. Um, other point I just wanted to mention quickly as you were just coming up to the hour, but uh, there's all the part of the the, the the measures that they're looking to to bring into legislation is also a prohibition on enforcement of termination clauses, which I guess may be relevant to, to, to a number of the on the call. And that's really that suppliers will be prohibited from enforcing a termination clause 
that they may have in their contract. Uh, and you know, typically you might find in your contracts that you're allowed to terminate in the event of uh, your counterparty's insolvency. Um, previous, uh, already before the, this, this new um, prohibition is brought into place, there's already restrictions on certain sort of essential services being terminated, as you'd expect, sort of, sort of uh, utilities, telephone, internet, I, a server, cloud server type stuff. Um, that's already been in place that those uh, services cannot be terminated as a result of insolvency. Um, they're looking to extend that more generally so that suppliers uh, are not allowed to enforce those termination clauses just generally for insolvency. And that would also be extended to any grounds connected with the, the, the counterparty's financial position. So that, that, that moratorium I just talked about would be one such thing. So if the, the shield comes down on a, on a distressed but viable business, um, suppliers would not be able to terminate their contracts as a result of that. Um, it's, all, it's all part, I guess, of a, a, a trying to improve the rescue uh, uh, culture that in the UK and, and perhaps perhaps allow more businesses to, to, to preserve their the, the business in place. Um, uh, the final point is just uh, there is a sort of reference to a sort of, uh, sort of US Chapter 11 procedure a restructuring plan, and um, which which again is also uh, intended to be brought into place. Uh, again, that will have some similarities similarities to the U.S. process. It's a court-led process, but it would fundamentally allow the existing company to bring that process into play, um, and for the existing management to implement that that scheme. Um, and part of that would also be uh, something that's the, the the UK have looked to the US system as, as having an attraction, the ability to sort of cram down dissenting uh, creditors who don't agree to the plan. So that in terms of implementation, it, it would be slightly easier. Um, and it's all part of the sort of similar um, efforts on the government's part to maybe make it slightly easier to, to, um, to um, implement rescue plans. And we've seen that even on the kind of high streets sort of Carluccio's and Debenham's uh, administrations where in the normal course, the administrator would get appointed and he would take over control and manage that business with the intention of then selling it on. Uh, there's almost an, a, some new concept of administration light where um, the administrator gets appointed, that brings down the moratorium shield against creditor enforcement, but they're then effectively consenting to the directors being given back day-to-day -day management of the business and primarily that's because the existing management running the business on a day-to-day -day basis probably will be much cheaper than throwing a whole bunch of insolvency practitioners from outside to go and run that. So that light touch is there hopefully only to supervise the directors attempts to stabilize and rescue the company. So I think these are all positive steps being taken. Uh, I guess the the one point to note is that they they haven't actually been brought into legislation yet, uh, yet, and we haven't actually got details of when when that is likely to be. So, um, so there are there are some positive steps, but ultimately, um, it, it all comes back down to the you know, cash is king in terms of being able to keep the show on the road and at least assess uh, assess your your options. Um, I see that so just past the hour, so I appreciate we do want to keep people beyond. Uh, beyond that time. Um, so I'm just going to bring sort of things to uh, a close at the moment. I'd just like to thank you all for attending. Um, we didn't get a chance to get on to any of the, the chat queries, so apologies for that, but we can certainly follow up in due course and, and you should have all of our contact details should you want to get back in touch. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd just like to thank you and uh, good day. <laughs>